Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Matthew Shavlovsky. Um, I am a former liberal arts and criminology major and current civil engineering student. Um, I was born into a family that is pretty unconventional in religious terms. Uh, I have a pretty nuclear family, mother, father, uh, two younger siblings, both uh, brothers. Um, as far as our religious, spiritual, moral upbringing goes, um, we weren't really raised in <clears throat> the kind of the kind of atmosphere that where organized religion was very strongly emphasized. Uh, we were raised with a, a sort of uh, moral upbringing that was very inspired by the kinds of concepts that my parents were raised in. Uh, my mother was raised in a predominantly Christian household, so she adopted many uh, Christian beliefs, but she as a person is a very uh, very self-aware, very intelligent, opinionated, <laughs> uh, scrutinizing and skeptical person and she found in her explorations of Christianity there were <clears throat> a lot of things that didn't really agree with her nature and that she didn't really agree with. Um, as far as my father goes, he was a very simple man raised in a, a farming household in Nova Scotia. I believe he was raised with a, a Christian background as well, but uh, as far as those teachings, those didn't really translate to our upbringing. Um, my mother and, like particularly on my mother's side of the family, there was a very much a, a living spirituality through through her teachings. Uh, there, there was that, that Christian foundation, there was a high regard who, for Jesus Christ, whom I know now as uh, Islam. Um, there was a very strong emphasis on trying to go back to the roots, you know, the, the essential teachings. And the essential teachings of Christianity as we understood them were very much rooted in love, in tolerance, in acceptance, in peace, in fostering peace and harmony between people of various differences and various beliefs and so on and so forth. Uh, a, a lifestyle of humility, a, a lifestyle of giving to charity, taking care of those less fortunate than us. Um, we didn't have much to give ourselves, but what, what little we did, we tried to use for, for the betterment of the people around us. Uh, my mother had a reputation in our area as kind of a, almost like a Mother Teresa kind of figure, in the sense that we, we grew up in the Jane and Fincher neighborhood. So, uh, <clears throat> Jane and Finch's reputation precedes itself. It's a uh, very high risk, unstable. The, this is the, the kind of impression that the Jane and Finch community has. Uh, and the, the aspect of community itself is, is really not given as much attention as it should because there is a really fantastic community in the Jane and Finch area. But the fact remains that there are a lot of children being raised there in single parent households. <clears throat> being raised in households that don't really have have much in the way of of means and in much in the way of financial stability or security and even those who are working in the single parent house or even those who are being raised in the single parent households who have a very strong moral center who who are are raised with a very good sort of uh, conception of what it means to be a good human being even then, there are limitations because their mother or their, their single father would be <clears throat> working so much. There's so much more of a burden on them to take care of their household. So a lot of them just end up, through no fault of the, the parents, just being raised by television and being raised by their friends and perpetuating the cycle of children raising children. And a lot of these people just incidentally found their way into our lives, you know, and uh, a lot of our influence would kind of bleed through to them. Uh, I can recall so many instances of, 
of friends of mine who became really good friends, and my mother was always so welcoming. She, non-judgmental, doesn't care what kind of background you are. You treat my children good, you have a home here. And she meant that in a very literal sense. There were people who would come to our household and stay for weeks, months at a time. They'd have dinner with us. We, they would be treated as family. They would have a conception of family that didn't really get in, in their own households. And that, I, I feel, is very high praise to my mother and the kind of moral content that she passed on to us. And we, we my brothers, try to embody that the best we can as well, stay true to that legacy. As far as our, our spiritual upbringing goes, uh, <clears throat> there was a very strong Christian foundation. Uh, a lot of those teachings are rooted in Christianity, but not entirely. Because uh, my mother, she was born of a Polish father and a Filipino mother. So there was a lot of culture that was brought in from that side of her family as well. And a lot of traditions and superstitions and such beliefs that, that carried on there. There was the Christian influence as well, but it kind of established a family culture that was extremely conscious of the, the moral qualities that I've discussed, the, the moral concepts that I've kind of gone over here, as well as an awareness of something more than we as humans can perceive. You know, the, there are limitations to the sensations that we can experience, the things that we can actually perceive with our eyes, hear with our ears, so on and so forth. There was always this acceptance of, of a force that exists beyond what can commonly be perceived by humans. Uh, my mother and my grandmother referred to them as the Duendes. This uh, presence, the, these, these otherworldly beings that, that couldn't be necessarily seen by human eyes, who had a, as much of a, a presence and as much of a, a shaping in the world that we understand as, as, as us humans do. And there was also this very strong belief in the hereafter, very much the Christian conception of the hereafter, the idea of heaven and hell. My mother was always very strongly, a, a very strong believer of those concepts. She the word God was used in our conversations a lot. She was, she's a very strong believer of God, Allah, and a lot of the objections that she had to Christianity were first and foremost rooted in this idea of worshiping a man. You know, that, like she, she believed in the teachings. She believed that these were the teachings of a very, very good man, but there was something that didn't sit right with her about accepting this man as a savior to the scale that the common Christian does, to accept this man as a divine being, you know. And so as far as that sort of orthodoxy goes, that was very much omitted in the teachings and just focus on the message rather than the messenger. Um, I had a very, very, very minor exposure to Islam growing up because I had a lot of Muslim friends um, I knew they didn't eat pork, but I didn't know why. <laughs> um, I knew that they, they prayed a lot more than the Christians that I knew. <laughs> um, my, my knowledge of Islam growing up was very limited until I got to my like early mid-teens or so, uh, because Right around then is right around when I started to become more aware of the media, started to pay more attention to news and develop this, this desire to be more of an active participant in my society and <clears throat> have that awareness because my mother had always taught me that I should know these things. Right? So I would pay attention more and more to these and I would see these depictions and images and the way that people would talk about Islam. And that fostered a curiosity in me. So I, I kept seeing this word, Islam, 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 Muslim, Muslim, throwing around, being thrown around all over the media. And 
And I've always considered myself a very self-reflective, introspective, curious, inquisitive person. I was like, what, what is this Islam, right? So that, that sort of sparked the curiosity. And one day, going downtown on a shopping trip with some friends or something, maybe going to a movie, I don't know. Uh, we were walking past the Eaton Center, and <clears throat> we came across one of these booths, and a man with a megaphone and a sign. It's like, hey, free information in Islam, free information in Islam. And it came right around that point where my curiosity was kind of peaking. And before I had kind of dabbled a little bit in it, did some internet searches and things like that. But this was the first time that I had ever held the Quran in my hands. When I was 14, I believe, I may be mistaken. But yeah, they, they passed me this edition of the, the Quran, the Sahih International, I think it is. Uh, yeah, the, this translation here, take this, take this too, take this too, take this too. And, and I took it home and between reading Goosebumps and Anne Rice novels, I see this, this book, which I regarded as just another book at the time. The whole time I'm reading these books, I can feel my eyes starting to pull in this direction. And I started to lose interest in what I was reading, and I was like, maybe I should read that one. <laughs> so I would take the Quran and I would start to explore it. And it was a really fascinating experience. Uh, I was going through it and I started to notice a lot of the similarities. Because the, these media portrayals of Islam were very divisive, very contentious. They, they would speak of Islam as, as, such, as, as something so foreign, as something so deviant. And I am reading this and I, I'm not seeing any of that. It's like they're, they're talking about all the same people. They're sharing all of the same stories. The structure is a little different, but I know these stories. I know these people. Where is all of this vitriol coming from? You know? <laughs> and it, it, it fostered that curiosity. And eventually that, that started to die down a little bit as my priority has shifted back to my own worldly development. And my Quran kind of found a little box in the closet and stayed there for quite some time. Uh, I didn't really know much or explore much after that. I, what I would read in, in news articles, things like that, at blogs on the Huffington Post, and in all fairness, a lot of the, the blogs that I did read were pretty extensive. They, they covered a lot of the, the foundations of Islam, and I, I started to feel comfortable in a general sense that when somebody would say Islam or somebody would introduce, to me, introduce themselves to me as, as a Muslim, I had a pretty general sense of, of what that meant. Of course, it was a very superficial sense, but that, that kind of, that, that's kind of where my knowledge of Islam kind of ends at that point. The reversion itself, as far as the, the practices and ideologies of Islam, as far as my own personal identification, I've considered myself a Muslim for quite some time now, actually. Um, I have been adopting these, these practices and philosophies and teachings for the better part of a year and a half, close to two years now. Um, my first Salat was maybe a year ago, maybe before that. It was, it was pretty close to Ramadan. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as what, what influenced that presence in my life, as so many of these stories <laughs> start, as so many great stories in the history of humanity start, that, that passion, that curiosity was kind of reinvigorated, reinvigorated by a woman. <laughs> I had incidentally met this amazing woman. I was at a, a stage in my life that was pretty dark, that I found myself having a lot of questions that weren't really presenting any satisfactory answers. 
I was kind of in a bleak sort of state and I come across her and she has this amazing light emanating from her. In, in her presence I felt this, this warmth that I hadn't felt in, in such a long time and it was inspiring. I, I had to know her. <laughs> and we got to know each other in a very decent way. You know? and we would, our, our interactions were, were so much influenced by very heavy, weighty discussions. We weren't talking about TV shows. We weren't talking about what dress Kim Kardashian wore to whatever. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> We were talking about the philosophies of John Locke, the, 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 the teachings of the ancient Greeks, heavy stuff, and Islam. The, the subject of Islam kept coming back and forth because we're sharing a meal and she asks the server, do you serve halal? And that sparks off this amazing discussion. What, what is halal? And substance, <laughs> spirituality, what, what do you believe? What do I believe? How do you understand the world around you? How do I understand the world? And I, I wanted to know her. I wanted to keep talking to her and keep learning. And, and the more that, that she would say, the more it would inspire me. And I've always been the kind of person that, that when I'm, I'm told something, I don't just accept what I'm told. I go home and I search it up. I, I research it. I fact check everything. <laughs> Just because I was raised in a culture that was so predominantly defined by deceit and propaganda. <laughs> so that, that skeptical side of myself really kicks in. And we had some really contentious, really heated debates. And because she's a very smart, very opinionated woman. I'm very smart. I, I consider myself a pretty intelligent, very opinionated man. And we didn't always agree with each other. <laughs> so we had some pretty passionate conversations. And a, as, as strong as my opinions are, I'm always open to the possibility that I'm wrong because I'm first and foremost a truth seeker. So I would look into the things that she's saying and what, what is this that she's telling me? And is she right? Should, should I think about this? And it started to shape my perspective in very unique ways. More and more, our conversations were less and less philosophy in a general sense, less and less life in a general sense. What, what are our goals, what are so on and so forth. And more and more, we would speak in the context of Islam because more and more I would look into these things and more and more I would research these things and more and more I would read into it. And more and more I would have, be able to actually contribute to these conversations within the context of Islam. I would actually be able to fall back on certain things that I've read. And she inspired this eagerness in me to, to even share the things that I've read. So. It's like, oh, I just read this, I just read this. How do you feel about this? Do you agree with this? And so on and so forth. And that just began to have some very profound changes in my life. I, I noticed this, this warmth in me, like, this nur. <laughs> nur is the word that she used. She, she told me that she saw a light in me. And as our time passed, she, could tell, she told me that she could see this light growing. And, it was having very pronounced effects on the way that I was intera interacting with people. The, the word choices that I would use. Uh, I was a pretty arrogant teenager. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah um, I could feel a lot of that, that falling back. I, I could feel a much more subtle quality to my voice when I would speak and it, it started to, to change me. Mm -hmm. And it changed me in a way that I liked. It, it shaped me into the kind of person that I've always strived to be. You know? And more and more with, with her, her influence and with her hadaya, even when I was not in her presence, these were thoughts that have been, like the, the seed had been planted in my mind. I had been researching these things completely independently of her and incorporating these practices independently of her, forwarding these questions to the local imam. She introduced me to our local mosque, actually. I went with her and I've been attending regularly for as much as I can 
it's difficult with school and, and jobs and such, but whenever I have that time, I'm there. And that, she, she had that influence, but even when, when she wasn't there, even when she, she wasn't that pronounced uh, presence in my life, I, I was there. This had already become a part of me. You know, uh, so as far as the, the Shahada goes, that in itself, I've, my inquiries into the Shahada received a very mixed response from people. I, I had been curious about this. I had been experiencing a sense of community that I had never experienced before. The, these people who were coming to me and so encouraging and so, so warm, even before I had declared myself as a Muslim, they were like, uh, here, you, you should read these, you should talk about this, and all of the, these teachings. Yeah, so it, it, it instilled this desire in me. It's like, how do I know more? What, can, what, what more can I do? How do I become a part of this? And, and I would ask around, and it started online. I was reading about what the literal definition of the Shahada is, and what, what components are necessary to actually consider the Shahada valid, and, and so on and so forth. And, and I'm reading this, and I'm feeling very strongly that everything that they're outlining, this submission to the oneness of Allah, this acceptance of the, the beliefs and this adherence to the, the teachings of the Prophet this declaration, these are already things that I've been doing. These are already things that I've said. These are already things that I've done. Am I a Muslim now? <laughs> Have I been a Muslim all this time? So I had this presence in my life and all of these inquiries and questions that I had and I'm directing them to all of these people and all of these people are telling me, you're, you're already there, you're, you're already a Muslim. And, and this seemed like such a foreign concept to me because like words have meanings. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like if this is the title that I'm going to be attributing to myself, I want to know exactly what that, that title means, what is required of me? I, all of this time, when I had been adhering to these practices and theologies and so on and so forth, whenever anybody asked me about my religious background or what my religious identity, I had always been very careful and very apprehensive about answering those questions because answering them creates certain expectations. You know, uh, even though, for the most part, I had been considering myself a Muslim, there was still that apprehension because I didn't exactly have a full understanding of what being a Muslim entailed. What are the expectations of a Muslim? What, what, what does it mean? What, what, what changes? A am I doing anything? Do I believe anything that is contradictory to this? And so I, I had always been tried to be very, very careful about that because even though I felt like I might have had some divergent beliefs, I had a very, very high respect for Islam, and I didn't want to disrespect Islam by attributing this title to myself and presenting myself as a physical representation of Islam and an ambassador of Islam and not subscribing to essential qualities that, that make a Muslim. It's like I can't be sitting there with a pulled pork sandwich in my hands, like, yeah, I'm Muslim, right? It's, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so. I had always been very apprehensive about that, but I was at that stage where, I was, okay, okay, what else do I need to know? What other rules are there? there? There has to be something I'm missing. I had been like this because I take my commitments to God very seriously, to Allah very seriously. This is an awareness that I was brought up with. This is a presence that I've accepted my entire life, and it's there, and I'm accountable for any commitment that I make. So I want to make sure that if I'm going to take this step, I know exactly what's expected of me. I don't want to be going in ignorant and then plead ignorance later. So I was very apprehensive about introducing myself as a Muslim because I didn't really have a full sense of what that meant yet, but I felt at, I, I got to a certain stage where it's like, you know what, I'm ready to make this official. You know, there, there has to be some kind of formal process. There has to be 
something, you know. I am ready to identify as a Muslim and I want that to be known. How do I do this? <laughs> so I went to my mosque, I asked these questions. It's like, did, what, what is the formal process? What is the formal conversion process? What is the formal reversion process? What, what do I have to do? And they tell me, all you have to do is say these things. Say this, make your declaration. Have that intention. Say it and mean it. <laughs> right? And I was like, what else? It's like, there is nothing else. <laughs> like, that can't be it. I've already done that. <laughs> and I, I just kind of had to take peace in, in the knowledge that I'm already there. But literally the week after I had forwarded these questions to my, my sheikh, the way that my mosque is structured is very often they'll have guest speakers come through at the end of the month, but for the most part, the, the khutbahs are held by, are held in rotation by two different sheikhs. And I had spoken to this one before who, who I had come to hold in very high regard. I forwarded a lot of questions to him and his responses always inspired confidence in me. So I had been asking him, I had already had that basis with him. And I had asked him this, and he's like, he himself was a, a revert. Yeah, he, he was telling me the story of his mother, who reverted to Islam as well. And she, he was saying that, yeah, I, I did my shahada this way, but she, her, her conversion, she, she did it in rural Georgia in her basement. She took her shahada there, and Allah sees and hears all things. Her shahada is just as valid as mine. And the circumstances of her social context, only two people know she's Muslim. And that's perfectly okay. So as far as I'm concerned, you're Muslim. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. And I felt like it's something that should be celebrated, but I didn't really know what to do because like the precedent had already passed.